I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, Yapeng Su. Uh, Yapeng received his PhD in chemical engineering at Caltech with Jim Heath and David Baltimore, followed by research in Leroy Hood's group at the Institute for Systems Biology, studying systems immunology of COVID-19, which I think is what he'll tell us about today. And he recently started his postdoc at Fred Hutch uh, with Phil Greenberg and Rafael Gotardo, and his goal is to utilize systems level big data and machine learning to determine how to better engineer live immune cells as an effective therapy for treating cancer and other diseases. And the title of this talk today is Multi-Omics Resolves a Sharp Disease State Shift Between Mild and Moderate COVID-19. Go ahead, Yaping. Thanks, thanks so much, Stacy, for the very nice introduction. Um, and it's such a great pleasure for me to share with all of you our most recent research on COVID-19 immune response. So we all know that our immune systems are very important to protect us from very infections, but there are still so much unknown about how our immune system responds to this particular SARS-CoV-2 virus and also why people with different disease severity will have so much differences in their immune response. To address these questions, we decided to take a systems level approach to take a deep dive into a large cohort of patients spanning across different levels of disease severity. So far, we have analyzed 265 COVID-19 sample in comparison with many healthy donors. So for each of the samples, we have characterized the PBMC immune cells with single cell resolution using single cell multiomics, which provided us the whole transcriptome, 192 surface micro level, T cell reception, and B cell receptor level, all from the same single cells. We have sorry, all Ping, we're not seeing your slides. Oh, I'm so sorry. There is something wrong with the screen sharing. So let's continue for our discussion. To address this knowledge gap, we decided to take a systems level approach to analyze a large cohort of patients spanning across different levels of disease severity. And so far we have analyzed around 265 COVID-19 samples in comparison with many healthy donors. And for the COVID samples, we analyzed their whole, their PBMC immune cells using single cell multi-omic approach, which provided us the whole transcriptome, um, 192 surface micro level and T cell receptor and B cell receptor sequences. We have also analyzed immune cell functionalities using single cell secretum technology from Asoplexus. This technology was actually originally developed in the HIS lab and now commercially available and being well used to characterize T cell functionality for cell therapy product. And we also have analyzed the plasma global proteomic and the metabolomic profiles for the same patients. And we integrate those informations with the electronic health record of those patients. So let's first take a look at the immune cell data. We all know that the immune system is very heterogeneous, but single cell analysis are able to pinpoint what are the exact phenotype for each of the individual immune cell we analyzed as shown here on this U map. And after the immune cell phenotype annotation, we can of course looking at their percentages from patient with different level of severities. And you can see here from green healthy to mild yellow to moderate orange and to severe red, there is a decrease of CD8, CD4 and NK cell percentages and the increase of monocyte percentages, which is consistent with the well-reported lymphopenia in COVID-19 patients. And we also know that for each of those major immune cell type, there is also heterogeneity within all of them. So we decided in the next following slide to take a deeper look at each individual cell type. So let's first take a look at CD8 T cell, which are the killer cell that are supposed to kill the virus infected host cell to further clear the virus. So for CD, CD8 T cells, uh, once it sees the virus, it can get inactivated and go from a naive phenotype to change to a more activated effector phenotype. 
and we do see that when we go from healthy to mild to moderate, there is a decrease of naive percentages and increase of effector percentages, indicating the T cell are indeed activated. But interestingly, if we go from moderate to severe, instead of keep going up, there is a significant decrease of T cell activation. And this is, um, this may potentially come related to why those severe patients are so sick. Potentially they just have some problems with T cell activation. And this also resolved some of the debate going on in the field. Some people say that the T cell are getting more and more activated in the severe patient and some other people say the opposite. And they are probably just capturing different subfraction of the spectrum of severity. And this also emphasizes the importance of why we need to perform such a huge study to fully capture the full spectrum of disease severity. So in addition to the naive and the effector subpopulations, one of the subpopulation many of us are interested in is exhausted phenotype, where when the T cell goes through prolonged antigen exposure, it can become dysfunctional and lose ability to kill and lose ability to proliferate. And we wonder, do we see T cell exhaustion in those COVID patient sample? And if we do, will checkpoint inhibitors be a valuable therapy to potentially rejuvenate the T cell functionality and um, therapeutic strategies? So we look into our CDA T cell data and we do find a subpopulation of CDA T cell, this cluster A CDA T cell, which have the highest exhaustion transcriptome signatures. But interestingly, in, instead of the decreased proliferation ability, it actually have the highest proliferation signatures also. And in the meantime, didn't fully lose the naive signature as many of these effector cells do. So this is really a hybrid phenotype. And in fact, this hybrid phenotype percentages keep increasing with the disease severity going up. And this um, proliferative exhausted phenotype are in fact very similar to many of the other people reported in other chronic infection or chronic settings and cancers that um, there is a proliferation hierarchy. And in fact, this proliferative exhausted phenotype are not only existing in the CD8 killer T cells, but also detected in CD4 helper T cells. And within the helper T cells, their percentages is also positively correlated with disease severities. You may think that because this phenotype is highly proliferative, so likely they are probably the highly expanded phenotype. But in fact, this is not the most clonally expanded phenotype in COVID. What is the most, uh, what is the most clonally expanded phenotype in CD4? Actually, is another interesting phenotype called cytotoxic CD4. This is interesting because generally CD4 are helper and helper generally don't kill. But there are circumstances where CD4 helper T cell do gain the killing ability. And that was when the CD4 T cell are repeatedly seeing the antigen over and over again. And this makes us think likely this cytotoxic CD4 are SARS-CoV-2 specific and they are just keep seeing the very, um, keep seeing the virus antigen over and over again, especially in this modern and severe patients. And in fact, more than 95% of highly expanded T cell receptors are all coming from this unique subpopulation. So you can see that there are two very interesting CD4 phenotypes. There is this proliferative exhausted phenotype. There is also this cytotoxic CD4. What are the relationships between these two interesting phenotypes? So we look at the relationship at these two cytotoxic and proliferative exhausted phenotype and their connections with other phenotypes in CD4. And you can see that there seems to be a bifurcation structure where the naive phenotype is residing at the root of the bifurcation. And each of these two interesting phenotypes is actually sitting at the end of these two different branches. 
and all other phenotype of CD4 are either intermediate along the top branch or intermediate along the bottom branch. This is really indicating that there seems to be two distinct destinations for a given CD4 within COVID. And we also perform T cell receptor analysis, and we do find that this T cell receptor coming from this cytotoxic CD4 have a very different TCR sharing patterns with the T cell receptors coming from the other proliferative exalted phenotype indicating that a photo confirmed these two interesting phenotypes are likely very different functional phenotype and potentially indicating this two and distinct destination may potentially connect it to their T cell receptor antigen interactions. So we have a look at this adaptive immune cell type from CD8 and CD4. We also look at the innate immune cell types. And one of the innate immune cell type we looked at is monocyte because a lot of people are suspecting monocyte are potentially contributing to the cytokine storm well reported in a lot of those COVID patient sample. So we wonder, do we see more pro-inflammatory cytokine expressed in the monocyte for the severe COVID patient samples? And in fact, we find the opposite. We find in the most severe patient sample, their monocyte is actually dysfunctional. Their monocyte lose the ability to produce the proliferative uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, and they also lose the ability to um, present antigens. So this type of dysfunction is very similar to what people call the immunoparalysis that is well observed in sepsis, a completely different infections. And in fact, this dysfunction of monocyte is actually correlated with the plasma L6 level. So this plasma protein and the transcriptome connection of monocyte triggered our interest to systematically connect the protein global proteomic profiles with immune cell transcriptome profiles in the monocyte. And we do find that for the pathways that enriched for the plasma proteomic profiles are almost exact the same pathway that are enriched for the monocyte transcript correlate with severities, indicating there's a strong connection globally between the plasma proteomic and the monocyte transcriptome. We also looked at the B cells and NK cells, but because of the time limitation, we probably do not have enough time to cover that. But what, what I do want to cover in the rest of my talk is a completely different angle to look at the immune response. So in all of my previous slides, we have been talking about different immune, res- different immune cell type and their response separately in isolation. But if you think about it, really, our immune response is supposed to be a symphony where different immune cell types are doing different jobs. They're like different instruments play very different music, but they all have to play together in harmony to respond to the virus. But the question is how? How do these different cell types coordinate in the context of COVID? And more specifically, how the gene expression of thousands of genes are co-regulated across all different cell types in patients with different level of disease severity. This question is really not easy to address simply because the large data set we are dealing with. If you think about it, we have around 200 to 300 patient samples and for each of the samples, we have many different immune cell types. And for each of the immune cell type, we have thousands of genes that are changing. So this is the enormous amount of data we're looking at, millions of data points. How do we simplify that? Well, that's the beauty of systems biology. We can really simplify the dimensionality potentially to just a single dimension and project our patient onto that dimension. And in fact, we are able to do that in our COVID contact to find a single variable which essentially reflect how our different immune cell type coordinately responds to this virus. 
And this single variable is actually calculated just based on the immune cell profiles. We didn't consider any of the real clinical data, but we can later check how different severity are projected onto this immune response module. And you do see that from healthy to mild to moderate and severe, there seem to be a gradually increase along this module. And more importantly, there seems to be a big jump between this mild disease to moderate disease, indicating there is a sharp immunological change between, moderate, between mild and moderate disease state transition. In addition to disease severity, we also have many of the clinical data we're taking from the hospital. And we find that many of the clinical metrics we measured from the real clinical setting are actually correlated with this immune response modules. For example, many of the clotting factors are positively correlated with this coordinated single variable, indicating that potentially many of the clotting problems those COVID patients are suffering are likely closely connected to these coordinated immunological changes. Similarly, we also measured the global proteomic and metabolomic profile in the plasma, but we didn't use that to calculate this single variable. But when we look at the cross correlations later, we do find that many of the signals we see are actually closely connected to this immune response module. For example, we do see that the pro-inflammatory cytokines are all increased along this module, and many of the important nutrient metabolite classes are actually decreased along this module, especially between the mild and moderate disease state transitions. And of course, we can later look more carefully how different immune cells are exactly doing when we go from left to right along these coordinated immune response modules for all of their genes, their proteins, and their pathways, and how they are correlating along this axis, and how different subtypes of immune cells are correlating with this coordinated immune response modules. And importantly, we find that many of those interesting phenotypes we discussed before, like the proliferative exhausted T cells, the cytotoxic CD4s, they all positively correlate with this coordinated immune response modules and start to appearing right at the transition between mild and moderate disease state shift. And this really tells us that our immune response to this virus is in the system, is coordinately regulated. And not only by using systems level biology approach, can we really simplify such complexity and to arrive on this simplified, unified picture of our coordinated immune response. And because of the time limitation, this is the only content I'm able to cover for today's talk. But I do encourage the audience to really take a look at our full story because there's a lot other interesting analysis we didn't have time to cover today. And finally, I'd like to thank um, Professor Lee Hood and Professor Jim Hees for the mentorship on this exciting systems immunology project. This is really a big team effort without my close colleagues from ISB and Swedish Medical Center. Really, we cannot achieve such a big study in just a few months. And I was so fortunate to work closely with essentially the world leading immunologists from Stanford, from Fred Hatch Cancer Center, from UCSF, from Seattle Children's Hospital. And we were so fortunate to have the sequencing support from UDAP. And finally, I'd like to thank the funding source. And with that, I'd like to stop here and I'd, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yeping. It was a great talk. Um, I'll ask one uh, question from the Q&A to start. Um, to what extent are changes in PBMCs that you've been showing reflective of tissue immune dysfunction, or do you have any sense of that? This is a great question. Um, we didn't have the chance to really mirror the direct tissue samples, but we were fortunate to analyze the plasma protein 
global, per, global plasma proteomic profiles. And we do see that there's a lot of tissue damage markers detected in the circulation that are actually closely correlated with our coordinated immune response modules. So that really indicating that there's a strong immunological connections between the circulation immune response and what's really happening in the tissue. Okay. Thanks. I'm actually gonna let our next speaker ask a question. Sure. Hi, that was a great talk. So um, I was wondering what are your thoughts about proliferative exhausted T cells? Uh, in Ida Meat Lab, we saw a similar phenotype in uh, melanoma patients in the tumor. Mm -hmm. So are they really exhausted or do they have a function? If they are dysfunctional, why do they proliferate? Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a great question. And in fact, this proliferative exhausted phenotype is also detected in HIV and in other people reported their melanoma patient samples. And, uh, um, and I think Professor John Wari have a lot of uh, documentations in their study. And they call this phenotype as part of the proliferative hierarchy in the exhaustion continuum program. And when we look at our clinical data, because we have a lot of like the, the clinical data we collected from the hospital, we do find many of the severe infection metrics that people routinely measure closely correlated with the percentage of this proliferative exhausted phenotype. And this indicating that there's this, this phenotype may just potentially indicating a very severe infection going on. And uh, so that the T cell is overactivated so that it doesn't even have enough time to fully turn off these naive signatures. So that was my current understanding of this phenotype, but there is definitely a lot we can further dive into this interesting phenotype. Thanks. Thank you very much. There are some other um, questions in the chat. So uh, if you have time, if you could go ahead and type answers to those people, I'm sure they'd appreciate it.